Okay, hello my friends. There's a lot of news to cover today, so we're going to just get right to it. 1170 Russians off the battlefield, 7 tanks, 9 armored fighting vehicles, 20 artillery systems, 72 vehicles and fuel tanks. Now, I'm going to talk about Kursk and I'm going to talk about Pokrovsk, um, but before we get to that, I want to show you a few other interesting things. Here are schools in Kursk. They're being lined with sandbags and concrete blocks to ensure safety. Now, the Ukrainians have treated the Russians pretty well in Kursk. I mean, not the soldiers, obviously, but the civilian population. So I'm not sure if this is some kind of stunt or if they really are trying to ensure safety. Such an initiative was invented in Kursk Gymnasium number 25. Despite distance learning, school children and adults have covered the windows with sandbags and glued the windows with armored fiberglass by their own efforts. The administration of the gymnasium asked all parents to be not indifferent to the issue of children's safety and help with reinforcement. Okay, I mean, there's that's that's legitimate if it's not just a stunt. Meanwhile, the Russians are destroying civilian homes and three children are among the 30 victims after a Russian missile attack in the town of Poglarod in Ukraine's Dnipropetrovsk region. I mean, the, the, the juxtaposition is just painful to look at. Okay, also Russians have shot Ukrainian POWs. Again, this isn't the first time. This was on CNN. I'm not going to show you the video, but it keeps happening. So the contradiction between the way Ukrainians treat Russians and the way the Russians treat Ukrainians is just stunning. Ukrainian forces made more confirmed gains in the Russian Kursk region. Ukrainian army sources say that they now hold 1,300 square kilometers in Russian lands. Now, that's I heard Zelensky say that just a day or two ago, and that sounds about right. Um, Russian special forces destroy another Russian convoy in Kursk. This was carried in the Kiev post. Um, so, we, I mean, that was a legit thing. Ukrainian army chief reveals that the strategy behind, or reveals the strategy behind the Kursk invasion. We're going to park here for a little bit and look at uh, half dozen paragraphs. He believes the Kursk operation has been a success. This is talking about Sersky. It reduced the threat of enemy offensive. We prevented them from acting. We moved the fighting to the enemy's territory so that the enemy could feel what we feel every day, Sersky said, in a rare interview that offered candid assessment of the war. In what's the most detailed explanation of the rationale behind the incursion, Sersky outlined key objectives of the operation to stop Russia from using Kursk as a launch pad for a new offensive. That's number one. And they were actually toying with that for some time. To divert Moscow's forces from other areas, that's two. To create a security zone and prevent cross-border shelling of civilian objects, that's three, and that's been wildly successful. To take prisoners of war and boost the morale of the Ukrainian troops in the nation as uh, overall. So, prisoners of war, yes, boost the morale. There's a little bit of a mixed feeling about that. So, there was a boost, um, a morale boost about a month ago when this first started, and then there's also a sentiment like, should we be doing that or are we going to lose per cross because we're doing that? And that's a real feeling, but we'll, it's yet to be determined what how that's all going to play out. If they hold on to per cross, it will certainly have been a clear victory. If they lose per cross, it'll be a mixed bag. Over the last six days, the enemy hasn't advanced a single meter in per cross direction. In other words, our strategy is working. We're going to come back to that in just a little bit. We've taken away their ability to maneuver and deploy their reinforcements from other directions, and this, is weakened, uh, this weakening has definitely been felt in other areas. We note the amount of artillery shelling as well as their intensity of their offensive has decreased, Sersky said. He said the enemy does, does have an advantage in... <laughs> Listen, look into all these. He has an advantage in aviation, in missiles, in artillery, in the amount of ammunition that they use. Of course, in personnel, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles. Like, they're outnumbered and outgunned by a long shot. We cannot fight the same way that they do, so we must use, first of all, the most effective approach. Use our forces and means with maximum use of terrain features, engineering structures, and also technical superiority. And that's exactly the kind of thing that they're doing. Sersky looked menacing as a when they changed out commanders, and Sersky was first put in. A lot of people were skeptical, but he seems to have proven himself. Now, this is an interesting time to see this because right now Zelensky's shuffling the cabinet 
and changing out people. And so there's some people that are pretty upset about Dimitro Kaliba being sent out and somebody else taking his place. I'm going to suspend my judgment until we see what the new guy does because um, Kaliba was excellent in my estimation. The other guy could be excellent as well. Maybe this is a positive thing. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. Okay, one of the objectives of the Kursk incursion was to draw Russian troops to its territory. And Zelensky said so much. Russia has moved nearly 60,000 soldiers for defense operations in the region. That's good. That moves them from somewhere else off the front line that was inside of Ukraine. And so that's, that's a positive thing. Um, now, let's look at down by uh, Avdivka, Volodar, um, that area near Pokrovsk. Russians push near Volodar and among the southern Pokrovsk salient. The aim is to capture Kirk Kirkohov and Volodar to pressure Ukrainian defenses in western Donetsk oblast and tie down reinforcements for Pokrovsk, says the ISW. Now, remember, he said over the last six days, Russians have not advanced a single meter in the Pokrovsk direction. Our strategy is working. If they can hold Pokrovsk, this will be a tremendous, Kursk will have been a tremendous victory if they can hold Pokrovsk. Now, how do they hold Pokrovsk? I don't think there's any real hope long term to hold Pokrovsk or in the, you know, over months unless General Winter comes early. So General Winter has generally aided uh, the Russians. But if now the first frost is supposed to be September 15th, if I understand my facts correct. And when you get frost and mud and that kind of thing, it's going to make it much harder for them to keep pounding at Pokrovsk or to be able to advance toward Pokrovsk. So the sooner winter comes, the better for Pokrovsk. Okay. The Russian propagandist is outraged that inhabitants of Kursk and Belgorod refuse to support the Russian army. Like people in Kursk are not like doing their part to support Russians. People do Russian people do not want the Russian army standing near their homes for this reason. They refuse to provide water or food or they sell at very inflated prices. They behave like prostitutes, he says. Well, maybe they're they're not happy about the way that they've been treated or that they're sacking their homes or or looting stores or that sort of thing. What happens when the local population does not support its own army? So he's unhappy about that. Contrast that to what you saw Ukrainians do for Ukrainian, uh, for the Ukrainian army or what Ukrainian army was doing for the local inhabitants. It's quite a contrast. Okay. Now, this other guy is talking about this. We have a war. We collect money for copters, for helmets, for underwear, and he's, ta he's in Russia to help our army, the Russian army, and you have dancing and singing for billions of rubles, the evacuees were given 15,000. And the artists, like Shaman, 6 million for performing at the new wave? What kind of feast is this during the plague? The Russians spoke harshly about the waste of millions on artists and holding a new wave at the time when people are giving their last to the army. So he's a Russian, upset that he's barely getting compensated for having to flee and they're getting what what's going on but i what i found really interesting was that was we've collected money for these things for the russian army underwear for the russian army like i thought you were the second army in the world like why are people having to collect for that okay Meanwhile, back in Washington, there's been no change in policy with respect to long-range missile capabilities. In a translation from Gary Kasparov, you can keep murdering Ukrainian civilians and we will protect you. That's kind of fair because that's the policy hasn't changed and we know that that's what the result's going to be. Meanwhile, Zelensky confirms Ukraine's allies, that's you know, the West, the United States and Britain and Germany and France, etc., are now withholding attackums, storm shadow, and refusing to allow Ukraine to strike Russia's launchers and airfields. Now, we know that they're refusing to do that, but it gets worse. They had some of these weapons and they're now depriving them of more of them. Okay, these operations allowed us to return security to the Black Sea and our food exports. Now we hear that your long-range policy has not changed, but we see changes in the attackums, storm shadows, and scalps, a shortage of missiles and cooperation, right? Because they're worried that, they're, that the Ukrainians are going to use it on Russian territory, and oh no, we might escalate. The amount that the U.S. gave Ukraine this month. Now, this is Jay and Keefe, and I trust Jay and Keefe, generally speaking, so I, I have not confirmed these numbers. 
But the amount that the U.S. gave Ukraine this month is what Russia spends in Ukraine every 18 hours. Now, I, I'm not sure about those facts. I haven't proved out those facts, but again, I trust the source. The Russian economy is 5.6% the size of the U.S. economy. But let's just look at this 18-hour figure. 18 hours. How many hours in a week? Well, there's 730 hours in a week. And if you divide that by 18, that's 1 40th. So what he's saying here is the amount that the U.S. gave Ukraine this month is 1 40th of what Russia is spending. Now, that's just the United States, but still. Now, let's look at the, the percentage of the size of the population. Russia is a tenth the size of the U.S. Um, so let's just use that as a round numbers. That would mean they're spending that much and they're a tenth the size of the U.S. US. It's just, it's crazy. Let's not even worry about the economy being, uh, you know, 5.6. Let's just round into 10th. So 140th. Effectively, the US support for Ukraine is 1 400th of what Russia is spending proportionately. I mean, it, yeah, it's just mind blowing. Okay, terrorist Igor Gherkin, uh, Strelkov, may leave a Russian prison. Remember, he was bad mouth and Putin got sent to uh, sent to jail for that. As a result, Igor Gherkin was re uh, replaced in uh, replaced imprisonment with military service. So he's appealing for this. this. This is not officially confirmed yet, but it looks like he may be going to the front line to serve out a sentence rather than going to prison. Which, you know, he Putin can get a twofer. He he'll. <clears throat> uh, effectively kill some Ukrainians while he's there and then probably catch a bullet somewhere along the way. Okay, Belarus propagandists show their true nature. Warning, his speech is truly disgusting. I'm not actually showing the speech. I watched what he had to say. I thought, there's no way I could even show this on YouTube without getting some kind of censoring, banning, demonetization, something out of that because it was just that terrible. So this is Belarusian uh, propaganda. Now, I'll put a link to this below if you want to see what he's actually saying. This is the least bad that he's said of all the parts of it. You can look at it below if you want to see what they're actually saying. I just, wow. But there's good news. Here's good positive propaganda. This is the commander of the Akhmat, uh, the, the Chechens, saying that Russia has already won the special military operation. Right, sure. Okay, and this is how shamelessly Russian propaganda whitewashes war crimes and genocide against Ukraine in the West. The director of Russians at War, it's a documentary uh, that suggests that we have to humanize everyone. This is a huge tragedy for our region. Okay, and so she's at a filming or like a film um, screening and that sort of thing. Look, it is a tragedy, but it's a tragedy caused by what the Russians are doing and what the Russians are doing to civilians. Check out this graph. This is uh, Greg Terry had this. Um, this is on his Discord. We talked about it yesterday when we were in uh, in a uh, video together um, talking about the armored ambulances that that are now starting to arrive. Um, the fundraiser that we did over the last few months. Uh, so here. So impact of objects by Russian missiles and UAVs. Civilian objects, 5,197 to just less than 2,000 on uh, military objects. Look at the orange. Orange is hitting civilian objects. Type of missile and what it's hitting. Is that not crazy? Like, and, and yet, we have to talk about how it's a, it's a tragedy and um, we have to humanize what's going on. No, this, these are war crimes, lady. I mean, that's, that's really where they are. Since the beginning of the war, there have been a lot of bridges destroyed between Russia and the West, which amounted to an impossibility of seeing each other. Well, there's a reason for that. But of course, here's Darth Putin, and we'll end with this, the uh, satire site. You see, we're the real victims in all this. All right, my friends, that's all that I have for you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the likes and the shares and the subscribes. And thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.